So, um, we were talking about trade and we were finishing up what can the reasons for making things harder, the reasons for making things easier, and some of the ways you can't make things harder and easier. But just for the fun of us, just for those of you that read the Wall Street Journal and that kind of stuff, watch your TV and that kind of stuff. Um, when it comes to trade, there ultimately is two interactions that are happening here. The first one we call the current account, which is talking about the flow of goods and services. How much stuff is leaving, how much stuff is coming in, and we don't talk about it in terms of stuff, we talk about it in terms of the dollar amount of stuff. So how much money is going out because of exports, how much money is coming in as exports. And that is the current account. And what does current account look like for us in the United States? We import more than we export. So guess what? Our current account is usually a negative number. So money is leaving the country. We've already talked about that. Uh, so we technically, they call that a deficit when our imports are greater than our sales. No, I don't have it. It's a deficit when our imports are greater than our exports. And that's what we, we have. Our current account in the United States is a deficit where a country like China or India that's doing more exporting than importing, they're in a surplus. They're making money off trade. So for a country like China or India that's making money off of trade, what happens for them? Well, they've got more money that they can use to buy more stuff in, in their own countries. There's more money within the borders of China that they can use to spend in China. There's more jobs being created because they're making more stuff. These are not only making stuff for their people, but they're making stuff for our people as well. So they're getting jobs, but they're getting higher prices. Because A, some of the products you're making instead of staying in the country, some of the products you're making are leaving the country, so that means there's fewer products there, the price goes up. And then B, because there's more money in the country, what happens when you have more of something? The value of each one goes down, so more money, the money is less valuable, you gotta give me more money to get my stuff. We talked about both of those last week sometime. That of course you all remember. But for us, where we are, American companies are losing money. There's let they have less money to work with because they're not selling as much as they could if they were because of the trade. Companies as a whole. So guess what? We have fewer jobs, lower prices. It's okay if you're buying things, but if you lost your job, that kind of sucks. So the United States generally we're in a, a current account deficit. The other interaction is what is called the capital account. Capital is what? Tools and equipment, right? Not products, the tools and equipment, land, and that kind of stuff. So what happens with the capital account is it's looking at the flow of financial assets. It's the difference between foreign investment in the United States and U.S. investment in other countries. How much money are Chinese businesses investing in the United States? How much money are American businesses investing in China? Those are the two sides there. I think. It does. We're here, we're going to be here before class is over, we're going to be here Thursday. And the test is next Thursday. So. What happens here is foreign investment in the United States versus U.S. investment abroad. What's happening for us? We're in a deficit here. We have more foreign companies investing in the United States than American companies investing in foreign countries. So we're in a capital account deficit. Because these deficits, go ahead here, okay. These deficits end up feeding off of one another. On one slide ahead, let's go here. They're in deficit together or in surplus together. Because think about it. the Chinese companies are selling products in America. They're getting American money. Or their American money is being turned into yuan and they've got extra money that they don't want to spend 
buying American products. So they have extra money, what are they going to do with it? Well, we have extra money, we don't need it, let's burn it. No. We have extra money. What was Haley doing with that extra money that she had a week or two ago? Yes. She was lending it to somebody with the form of investment. She's lending to somebody. She had this money she didn't need and she was doing it. I don't need it now, but I might need it and or in the future. So Haley was lending the money to me. But these other countries, the businesses, these Chinese companies, these Indian companies, these Vietnamese companies, these Canadian companies, they have extra money. And instead of just sticking it in a drawer somewhere, they're going to invest it. But a lot of the money that they ended up getting, some of it is American dollars. So what do they got to do with those American dollars? Do something with them here in the United States. And they don't want to take those American dollars that they've gotten selling to us and buy American products. So they buy American non-products. They buy our land. They buy our buildings. They buy our businesses. They will end up investing, taking that extra money and investing in the United States, buying land, buying buildings, buying, buying out other business. Remember last week I talked about how we don't have any TV companies in the United States? Well, they've either been run out of business or bought out. Um, that, that, that ends up being a trend. So the current account deficit, or current account surplus fuels the capital account surplus. Because they're making money off of us with the trade, they're going to take that extra money and they're going to use it to buy our stuff. Yes. Why, I mean, if they're buying all that stuff, here, how is it not making jobs? Well, that's where things come back around. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to tie, I'm going to, where I skip the slide, let me go back to that slide and I'm going to put a bow on it. So, when a country like China, for instance, I'm just using them as an example. Where they're getting more money from us, what are they doing? They have all that extra money. And they, they're going to invest it overseas. That's what's going on here. Remember we talked about that Toyota plane in Ohio last week? Or the, the, the Honda plane in Kentucky? Y'all ought to tour one of those. I mean, it's just, it's just that's how you show Oh, yeah, it, they they exist because they're like, well, we like to produce. Our workers are cheaper than American workers, but hey, we've got these extra American dollars that uh, we got nothing else to do with. So it's kind of like found money in the couch cushion. What do y'all do when y'all find money in the couch cushion? You spend it. You don't sit there and say, well, gee, this must have been money that should have gone toward the electric bill. I'm going to stick it in look of it. No. We don't do that. It's like found money, woohoo, and you spend it. It ain't part of the budget. That's what happens here. They're like, yeah, American workers make sharp, getting more an hour than our workers, but hey, it's almost, I'm not going to say, it's almost a free building, almost free machines because it's being paid for out of extra money they didn't need. So that you, using this extra money to buy that building, Ends so up they're saving enough money by doing that or whatever, you see this leftover money instead of having to borrow or do something in their own country to make up for the difference in the weight. So an interesting percentage of the Toyota cars in the United States are actually built in the United States. An interesting amount of the Hondas driving around in the United States are built in the United States. A lot of them still are coming from Japan, but it, I really don't know the percentages and I don't know that they want to share. But an interesting percentage of them are made here in the United States with the money that Toyota or Honda had left over after selling us a bunch of cars that they made. And the other thing is, because they had this extra money, they didn't need to go out and borrow money to build this new plant, right? Because they already had it. So their debt is actually lower. But they still take more. They still make some profit. Yep. By the building. Yeah, they're making a profit off of it. They're doing okay with it because it's just, it's just where is the financing coming from? Instead of borrowing from a bank back home to build a plant back home, they're sort of, they got this extra money they already had. They got it from us. And they're turning around and using it to buy the plant. But isn't the profit coming from American money? Yes. So they're just reinvesting? Yes. So they're not really making anything. So they're just continuing to grow the amount of the pile of money that they don't necessarily 
So, yeah, they invest in American money that they don't need into an American plant, that they're going to be making more cars to get them more American money that they don't need. That doesn't seem very bright. Yeah, but it might <laughs> But if it, it can continue snowballing, maybe, you know, the, just a picture of the day that Toyota is building cars in Ohio and then sending those, um, exporting those to other parts of the world. Right. Because land is very freaking expensive in Japan. Just too expensive. So it really kind of makes sense for a lot of that production to happen here because land is, like, like expensive in Japan. Yeah. A small country. Large population, high demand for a small amount of land, land prices are expensive. That's why there ain't a whole lot of agriculture going on in Japan. And that's why the, you think of, you know, watch the cooking channel or whatever, you know, Kobe beef. That is beef raised in Japan. It ain't that it's any really better than an Angus grown in America or anything like that. What makes Kobe beef the thing is because I can afford to eat a cow that was raised here in Japan. Forty dollars a pound, or whatever Kobe beef is expensive because a land and cow is living on is expensive. But for us, the American companies are losing money. Here again, because we don't have the money, we're losing out, and we end up increasing the amount that we owe to foreign creditors because we end up having to. An American business needs to borrow money. If Haley that isn't willing to lend the money, who does have extra money? The banks. The foreign banks. Oh, yeah, they have all that money. They have extra money. So, who do we end up borrowing money from? China. Japan, China, India. So, guess what? It's, it's small world after all. I'm not going to sing it. But the American government cares about what China thinks about us because we owe them a bunch of money. Uh, if you, if, okay, Haley, you lend me that money. And then you, you know, I owe you money, and then you see me riding around town being stupid and spending money left and right, and acting like an idiot, you know, walking around and throwing money around here, left and right. What are you going to be thinking? Are you saying, that's nice? <laughs> you can be mad. Because with the stupider I am doing with my money now is decreasing the chances that I'm going to be able to pay you back next December or whenever it is I'm supposed to pay you back. So she's going to be wanting to have a little bit of input in my behavior because, hey, I owe her money. And I need to be listening to what she's saying because maybe, just maybe, depending on the way the paperwork is written, she can come up and say, okay, you remember that $100 you owe me? I'm paying you back right now. Or break your legs. Because I'm scared of her, so I know she would say that. So with the Chinese businesses and their right by extension the Chinese government has some influence over the American government. Not overtly, but in yeah. The American government knows, well, we can tick off China, but we can only tick them off so much. Because if we tick them off so much, the tap gets cut off. There's no more money for there's no more money for American businesses to borrow. And guess what? The federal government of the United States is in debt. You've heard of the national deficit, the national debt, right? Who is buying all of these government bonds? Chinese businesses, Indian businesses, Brazilian businesses. Not you and me. How, how, how many of y'all got one of their savings bonds that we talked about? The grandma was graduated. One of them has one. It ain't us that's lending money to the American government because we don't have extra money. Haley had a little bit of extra money, she lent it to me at the insane interest rate. Who has extra money? These foreign businesses. So when you borrow from the foreign businesses, if you don't pay them back, is that a China issue or is that an American issue? It depends. It depends on where the contract was made, where the loan was going, how it was structured, because it's going to be paperwork involved and it depends on how it's written up. But as far as, okay, we owe China a bunch of money. Middle fingers in the air, forget them. What I said with that old thing where I had a little beep, but my tablet died, so I had a little soundboard thing. Anyway, <laughs> oh, but just. Okay. Okay, Chinese Communist Party. Chinese Communist Party. Chinese Communist Party. China, we owe you. I'm going to make up now. China, we owe you a trillion dollars. Let's screw you. We ain't going to pay it. <laughs> and so China's like, uh, well, we're going to come and take it. And next thing you know, we have World War III going on. 
And, okay, let's say we win. Well, okay, well, we win. Well, okay, since we just defeated you, guess what? We ain't paying you that trillion dollars, right? And now we owe it. Or if they beat us, well, they're going to get a trillion and more. But how much is it going to cost us in order to fight that war? It ain't going away. I mean, we, we, can't just, we can't just say, no, we're not going to pay you back. Because Haley, if I don't pay her back, well, she, she's hunting you down, right? She's hunting me down. They're going to hunt us down one way or the other. Because we're complaining, but they're not taking advantage of us. They're going to be complaining, well, you just took advantage of us, right? Too wrong to make her. Not so, necessarily rewarding because that's not our time. Yeah, they can. You know, the first thing they're going to do is if Haley lends me some money, then I don't pay her back, and then I walk up to Haley again and say, hey, can I borrow some more money? What's she going to do? Laugh. I think we had that conversation every day, right? So suddenly, I can't borrow money from her anymore. And if India finds out that we're not paying China back, you know, the Indian companies could be lending us money? Nope. Are there these companies going to lend us money? Nope. So suddenly, here again, we don't have any money that we can borrow in order to expand our businesses. And also, they're going to be like, oh, by the way, those things that we were buying from you, we're not going to buy from you anymore, and we're going to end up grinding to a halt. Saying. We'll end up into a recession, the depression, that kind of thing. So we can't really not get best around with it. And that's when they start. So, yeah. <laughs> so, to, to bring it full circle back to between Sam and Jane, they were sort of advanced at this. Well, what ends up happening? It, Toyota sold us a bunch of cars back in the 80s, 70s, and 80s. So, American car companies, we, we lost some of our market share. We, we don't have as many people working in America building cars now as we did 20 years ago. So the money went to Japan, and then they used it to buy the plant in Ohio, and they're hiring American workers. So now we're back to about the same number of workers working in the auto industry, but instead of all of them working for Ford GM Chrysler, now they're working for GM Chrysler Toyota. So the workers are still getting paid. And there's an aspect, but where's the profit going? The profit ain't going to Detroit. Where's that profit going? Tokyo, right? So the wages might be staying in the United States, but the profit is still leaving the country. If I can go back. So that's what ends up happening. So we sort of get some of this back because the wages, but where the profit is still leaving. But then, oh, just as far as the fun. It's like the fun thing for the auto thing, the workers kind of are getting messed up because the workers in Ford, GM, Chrysler, they're all unionized. They're the United Auto Workers Union. And guess what? The average salary for a UAW worker a few years ago, anybody want to guess? The hourly salary. Oh, hourly. Um, 10, 10, higher, higher. 20. Higher. Wow. Okay. 65. An hour? An hour. I'll go build some cars. And so you wonder why GM last week is like we're shutting down some plants because we got some cars that aren't selling too well. Yeah. But what is happening is because GM, Ford Chrysler, all of their plants are unionized. So they can't they can't really say, well, we're going to because some states you don't have to be in the union. It's like Virginia or Kentucky or Ohio. So if GM was to put a plant in Kentucky and say, well, okay, we got our first non-union plant and we're going to pay you all $20 an hour, that's the average rate that everybody else is getting in this state, what's going to happen? All else. the other plants for GM are going to go on strike. Why? Because they want, they're going to be mad. Well, if you're going to set up one plant that doesn't have union workers, well, what are you going to do? You're going to build another one and another one and another one, and suddenly the union doesn't exist anymore. We're screwed. So the union doesn't like that. So once GM starts making any move toward going against the union, all their production in total is going to get shut down. It's kind of a blackmail, game of chicken kind of thing, thing going on. So they can't do it. The Toyota? Sure. It's free money. They're going to build a plant somewhere. Well, they're going to build it in the state that's a right to work state, so they ain't got to mess with the union. So guess what? Even the cars that, that Toyota is making in America, they're making them cheaper than 
for GM and Chrysler because they're union, their workers are not union workers. I don't know what the wages are that they're getting, but it, even if it's thirty dollars an hour, but it's still a lot lower than what for GM and Chrysler had to pay. I mean, can they be? Or the pumps, like more than one time. Yes. Can it? Um, or the only asking you that very come and say, you know, can workers, you know, that I'm not saying that they are do a union on the house? You can join a union, you can create a union, you can form a union. I think I'm talking about this. About where I live, all the furniture companies and yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, they, they, the workers, the union rep came in and they talked to some people, they talked to some people, and they ended up getting the license that they got voted in. But in Virginia, we're a right to work state. Uh, you, don't have to here. you don't have to join the union. So if the union is there, you can show up and you end up being paid the same as everybody else, but then you just start paying union dues. But then everybody else that works there is getting mad at you because you're undermining their strength of the union. Because we're making a sacrifice, we're paying union dues, we're having union reps to be doing this negotiating, and here you are, free rider riding off of our sacrifice. You are supporting the cause of us brotherhood of workers. Oh, so, yeah. so you kind of get in trouble if you do. So a lot of times it's generally going to be kind of an all or none situation when it comes to the union being in the building. But anyway, we are planning on going there. That's something for next semester. But generally, these two are going to be in deficit together or in surplus together. They're called the twin deficits. Okay. So overall, when it does settle, when we're in the twin deficit that we are now, well, prices are lower. Woo. We get cheaper cars. We get cheaper clothes and stuff. Jobs are lower. A local ownership is going away. Not all the car companies in America are American car companies anymore. Not all the golf courses in America belong to American businesses. Yeah, that was kind of a running joke thing back in the 90s that like all the golf courses in America would belong to some Japanese company or the other because that's what they were investing in. It was a, that's just one of those tropes back in the 80s. But local ownership is declining because a greater percentage of the assets are being bought by foreigners that have this extra money as opposed to you and I that don't have the extra money. So you're with me? I meant to re look at this number. Can somebody, is somebody really bored can Google the uh, exchange rate for the British pound? But exchange rates, we think of it as voodoo, but it ain't voodoo. It's really, it's, it's how much you have to give in one country's currency in order to get a certain amount of the other country's currency. How many pounds do you have to give me for a dollar? How many yuan do you have to give me for a dollar? How many pesos do you have to give me for a dollar? And 70, 70%. Okay, 78. Uh, so one, ooh. Oh, we're, we're read the sentence. Um, okay, well, let me actually get the, uh, oh, it just says US dollar the first pound, one US dollar is equivalent to 0 0.7857 pounds. Okay. So that's gonna be about, How you convert the cash from one form of cash to another form of cash. But so, in order to get one British pound, you would have to give them a dollar twenty-seven cents. No, you're not. You still have because because right now a dollar twenty-seven that's enough money. To get a dollar the sun drop costs a dollar twenty-seven here in the United States wallet well, would only cost a pound in England. So you're exchanging enough money to get a sun drop in American currency for enough money to get a sun drop in British currency. It looks less on numbers, but it's real buying power. Yeah, it's just like uh, 100 pennies is a dollar. You know, each penny is worth less, 
but every time I give you a dollar, you give me a hundred pennies, I'm still made whole. So instead of being a one to a 100 relationship at this point, this one to uh, 1.27. So even if, like, say, when there was session, you take it to a what it change every day because what determines this balance is what can you buy with a pound in England? What would it cost you in American money to buy the exact same things? So that if the economy grows, it's not down to two dollars. Yeah, if our economy grows and their stays still. Our economy grows, prices go up in America, that means instead of a dollar and twenty-seven for sun drop, it's two dollars for sun drop. So what's gonna end up happening? The exchange rate would change. You'd have to give two dollars to an English person in order to get one British pound. So it really boils down to me how much what can I buy with a British pound? How much would it cost me in American dollars to buy the exact same thing? And usually when you look um, what Bobby was looking at, they're usually everybody, just for comparison's sake, we compare to the American dollar. So the exchange rate of the American dollar for American dollar is one. But generally, when you look online and you look at these exchange rates, they're going to give you how much of the other money would you have to give to get one US dollar? You'd have to give 78 one hundredths of a pound, like I said, 78 pence, in order to get one American dollar. That's the same as. Uh, one pound for a dollar twenty-eight. It's the same relationship that I went to Japan. It was pretty much a one-to-one -one ratio for one dollar to one pound. Um, but when I came back, the states actually came back out like a little bit ahead um, in terms of like when we got the exchange back from um, yen and dollars. These things change every day because of what's happening. In the economy every day. If the economy is getting better in England at the same time it's getting worse in America, a strong British economy where things are happening, if you were investing, where would you rather invest? In a strong English economy that's growing or a weak American economy that's shriveling up a dime? So which money would you rather have? The British money. So that British money is more valuable, so what are you going to have to do? You're going to have to pay more in order to get it. That exchange rate is going to be different. So this is based on the purchasing power of the money and the overall health and strength of the economies of these monies. And they change on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis. And remember I talked about hyperinflation, I talked about Brazil, the government is very unstable, very corrupt, very bad. And so nobody knew, you know, uh, did the people that are running the country today, are they gonna be running the country tomorrow or are they gonna have skipped down and gone somewhere else? We don't know, and so I'm not going to invest any money here. Are you going to invest any money? No. So the economy was very shaky there. Uh, in countries like Argentina, where, uh, oh my dude, I can't remember his name, uh, the dude, who I almost had it. Um, it ends with this, this, this like, the name Chavez, the name of Chavez. Anyway, um, he's kind of, he'll nationalize the industry. You know, he'll take it over and say, okay, now, now you belong to the Argentinian government. And so, am I going to want to invest money in starting my own business just to have the risk of the government taking it away from me? They can do that. They can do that. You can, you know, it happens an interesting round. And so, if there's a risk that the country's going to take away people's businesses and people aren't going to be investing in the business, that's changing the demand for the different currency. So these exchange rates, it's just what you have to do to convert. Yes. Say the American you know, economy is not growing, and you can get a whole bunch of money by sending a cash dollars. If if a guy did this and got a whole bunch of US dollars away from the economy growth and it's changing for you to get money. Yeah. It's just, you think the American dollar is going to be worth more in the future, then you can like exchange your pounds, get these American dollars, and then let it grow in the future, and then exchange it back, and you end up getting more pounds in return. That's what happened to Bobby. He just said when he went on vacation in Japan, he exchanged 
a hundred bucks of American in the yen, and at the end of his time, he had a bunch of yen. The yen he didn't end up spending, he exchanged back and got more than a hundred dollars of American because things change, and this changes every day. Because among other things, the stock market changes every day. The value of the companies changes every day. The profitability changes every day. Unemployment, inflation, all that stuff. Something's changing every day. These things tweak every day. But this ends up sort of driving a little bit what's going on in trade. It's sort of the okay, I've got, I'm a British company and I got rich, I'm a Chinese company, I've got a bunch of yuan and I want to buy American products. How much am I, my yuan am I going to have to give up to get the dollar bills I need in order to buy those American products? And so what may end up happening is this is exchange trade changes. That effectively is changing the price of the product. The American country company is Sundrop's not okay. Today we're going to charge dollar twenty-two. Tomorrow, okay, we're going to, we're going to charge dollar twenty-seven. Last week it was a dollar thirty. They don't change the price every day. Sundrop says I want a dollar a can, but the Chinese company is going to be sitting there saying, "Well, how many yuan do I need in order to get the dollar that I need in order to buy that can?" And today, I might need five yuan to get the dollar to buy the can. Well, tomorrow, I may need six yuan to get the dollar that I need to get the can. Because that can of sun drop is priced in dollars, so the exchange rate ends up impacting things as far as how much yuan do I need in order to get the dollars I need to buy the product. See how that ends up working? So it doesn't, America, America, businesses aren't changing their prices on a daily basis, on a weekly basis. But the price of foreigners end up paying does change because of this exchange rate thing. But they're not going to go through and start changing the state price because such not going to change the price of their soda because the price of their, their workers is the same today as what's as today. Like they're paying their workers in American dollars. Their electric bill is the same. Their phone bill is the same. All that kind of stuff is the same. So their price is going to be the same no matter what's happening with exchange rates. Pilots out of investments to your Nobody. It's determined by supply and demand for the currency. And the, the demand of the currency is going to be determining how much do we want to buy. The demand for yuan, how many yuan do we need? And guess what? We need a bunch of yuan. Why? Because we're buying a bunch of Chinese stuff. Right? So we need a bunch of yuan to the demand. In America, for yuan is going up, so what's going to happen to the price of yuan? It's going to tend to go up. But then there's a supply of yuan. How many yuan are floating around? I may need a bunch, but if I already have a bunch, am I going to go out and borrow anymore? No, I ain't borrow from Haley if I don't. If I already have plenty of money, if I got a million dollars in the bank, I ain't going to borrow a hundred dollars from. Her. Right. So the supply of how much this money floating around, the demand of how much this money floating around, is going to determine the exchange rate. The supply of yuan, or the demand for yuan, we need a bunch of it. So we're looking for it every year, which is helping to, on the next slide, weaken the dollar. But then flip side is Chinese companies, they've got a bunch of extra American dollars that they don't need. So what are they trying to do? Get rid of it one way or the other, exchange it for yen or rupee or whatever that they do need. Rupee says India. Or rubles, if you want to go to Russia, yeah. they exchange it for whatever other currencies they need. And so they're like, extra dollars I don't need, get rid of them, get rid of them. So they're pushing my, they're increasing supply for dollars, which does what pushes the price down. So there tends to, because of this trade deficit, there tends to be this push for weakening the dollar across the board, which we'll get to on the next slide. But a strong dollar that we hear about, you know, strong dollar, that means when a dollar's strong, you got to give me more yuan, more pounds, more pesos, more rubles in order to get my dollars. They're giving me more yuan to get the dollar to buy my sun drop. So when this happens, foreign products end up being cheaper because they're going to still price their products in yuan, in pesos in whatever. And so we as Americans have to give up fewer dollars to get the pesos we need to buy the Mexican product. We have to give up fewer dollars to get the rubles we need to buy the Russian product. 
So, our products are going to be cheaper, which is going to make it more likely we're going to end up importing more foreign products. So, which is going to be, you know, the strong, you know, like say our trade deficit is pushing our dollar weaker. Well, the strong dollar is going to tend to increase the amount of trade. It's going to tend to try to weaken the dollar. It's, it's a, so remember the automatic stabilizers we talked about in fiscal policy. We talked about the parachute behind a race car. You kind of get a little bit of that action going on here. But what ends up happening? Imports are going to increase. Exports are going to go down because if foreign products are cheaper compared to ours, our products are now more expensive compared to theirs. A Chinese person has to give up even more you want in order to get the dollar that they need in order to buy the sun drop on the shelf in China, right? So we're not going to sell as many sun drops to them. We're going to be buying their competition to sun drop. Good. Overall, prices are going to end up dropping here in the United States because of the increased competition. Jobs get lost when the dollar is stronger because we're not selling as much, we're not making as much, so we don't need as many workers, right? But the nice thing, you can buy more when you're on Vegas. Go. You can be like Bobby, and when you, when you land in Japan, and you don't have to exchange too many dollars to get the yen that you need when you're on vacation spending. And use in Japan for however they belong, and then you still have leftover money that you change and add it over here. Well, dollars back. So it's good. A strong dollar is good if you're going on vacation. Otherwise, yeah, yeah, strong dollar we think. Mm, strong, good, strong dollar. But otherwise, for businesses, a strong dollar is kind of a problem. Right? So it's different. For, yeah. for spenders, it's good. It's good the dollar is strong because I can get cheaper imported products at the store and it's cheaper for me to spend money when I'm on vacation. But otherwise, for businesses, strong dollar is a problem. With a weak dollar, it's the opposite. You don't have to give up as many you want in order to get the dollar. You don't have to give up as many pesos to get the dollar. So what ends up happening there? That makes our products cheaper in the rest of the world. The Chinese person doesn't have to give up as many you want in order to get great refreshing taste, etc. So their products are going to be more expensive. Our products are going to be cheaper. So we're going to sell more, buy less. Exports are going to go up, imports are going to go down. But Prices are going to end up higher in the United States because we're losing out on the cheaper imports because they don't need to cheap anymore. So we're buying the expensive American products. So we end up buying the more, relatively more expensive American products. But jobs are gained because we're making more stuff and selling it elsewhere. Not just making some drop and sell it in America, but we can make some drop that we're selling in other parts of the world as well. But then, your money doesn't go as far when you're on vacation, you step off of your ship, right? So, you can't just say strong dollar good, weak dollar bad. It depends on who you are. For some people, strong dollar is good, and some people, strong dollar is bad.